I'm reading from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verses 1 to 11. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verses 1 to 11. For everything there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to turn away. A time to search and a time to quit searching. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be quiet and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. What do people really get for all their hard work? I have seen the burden God has placed on us all, yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart, but even so, People cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. Amen. Hello, I'm John Taylor, and this is the Corpus Clock. It's just struck three. We're in the workshop just outside Cambridge, where it's being built. I'd like to show you something about it. So, where are the hands? I wanted to create a new and a different way of showing time. This is not a computer generation, but a true mechanical clock. To face the clock, depicts time as a wave coming out from the centre of the universe. Every second runs round the day, a pulse of light showing time racing away. To me, time passes slowly or more quickly depending on the circumstances. Time is relative. And as Einstein said, an hour sitting with a pretty girl passes like a minute. But a minute Sitting on a hot stove seems like an hour. Mm -hmm. I wanted my clock to catch the observer's attention and to make them think. Its heritage stretches back nearly 300 years to John Harrison and his invention of the grasshopper escape. For the corpus clock, I have enhanced the image of the grasshopper into a chronophage who munches a minute every 60 seconds. Thank you, Linda. I think we get the drift now. Time is drifting away, even as we speak. And we want to talk about time this morning. Have you got time? We've got time. 
let's uh, make time. And I'll turn this on just so that we're ready to go. If I can find the switch. There we are. Whitfield and uh, Wesley apparently can preach the gospel better than me, but they can't preach a better gospel. That was a quote from none other than C.H. Spurgeon. Have you heard of him? Yeah. C.H. Spurgeon was one of the great preachers of a century or so ago. And uh, he said that uh, Whitfield and Wesley were great preachers, that's for sure. But uh, the gospel they preach is the best there is. You can't preach a better gospel than that. Can you, Neil? Neil was reminding us of that during the communion talk this morning. Christ has accomplished much on his cross. Well, we're going to talk about time. And I'm going to start with a story. Well, an illustration perhaps. Imagine a bank that credits your account with $86,400 each morning. But it carries over no balance from day to day. Whatever is left over at the end of the day is cancelled. So you must use it while you've got it, while it's in your account. In fact, we have such an account, of course, but it doesn't deal in dollars, does it? Each day we have 86,400 seconds to use. Seize it. Make the most of it. It's a challenge, isn't it? And so easily those seconds drift away. Those minutes, uh, those minutes are lost. And uh, we fail to seize their potential. I like this story of a little boy who was stopped on his way to school, on his way into the classroom. We'll call him Tom. Now, Tom, why are you late? And Tommy <coughs> looked a bit tearful. He said, it was late when I left home, miss. <laughs> but why didn't you start earlier, the teacher wanted to know. Because, said Tom, it was too late to start early. Uh, that's uh, a fact of life, isn't it? That time gets away on us. And uh, we have a job to do, to find time for what matters in life. There was somebody here a few years ago, not here when we were at the Tullawong School, who did a communion talk, and uh, a friend of his, I think, had died. And he says, that does it. I've always wanted to get a gun. I'm going to get it now. Uh, uh, life is short, he said. Well, what would you do if you had time on your hands to choose what to do? Would you go and buy a gun? Would you go and buy a sailing boat like I did a few years ago and enjoyed it immensely? Uh, what would you do if you had time on your hands? And the opportunity, would you spend it on worthwhile pursuits? That's the challenge we all face in life. Well, I didn't uh, judge him for buying his gun and enjoying the gun club here at Caboolture for those times that he was here. And uh, I didn't judge myself either for buy buying that sailboat and enjoying those uh, weekends or Saturdays anyway up at Lake Gatharaba. We need rest and recreation. It's all part of the parcel that God has given us in this, in this capsule we call time. We uh, need to use it for our benefit and for the benefit of others. That's the point that I'm making. Well, I just want to uh, draw your attention to the title of the message this morning. There is a minute with eternity in it. Every minute that we have is a gift from God. And let's face it, there is eternity in it. Eternity starts now, if you like. Where are you drifting in your eternal destiny? Are we going in the right direction? Where does Christ, where does Jesus Christ focus in our thinking, in our aspirations, in our dreams, in our visions? Where are we going in life? Is Christ <coughs> the focus of our lives? Is God there moment by moment, day by day? That's the question we need to ask ourselves, of course, uh, because otherwise life will just drift and uh, we will miss the point of why God has put us here in the first place. Now, I thank God from the bottom of my heart for that trip to the UK, so I've given you a map, and I'm going to dwell on it, 
just to say that when uh, Moses came down from Mount Sinai, his face glowed. Well, I'm still living in the aura of that trip to the UK. I was looking forward to it. It just came out of the blue. Well, really, out of the death of a loved one, David Judson, who uh, was a missionary with us in the Middle East for quite a few years. That's the next slide. But just dwell on this for a moment, because the trip to Leeds and all of these places are in the wrong, all these names are pretty well in the wrong place. What happened? <coughs> I fixed Liverpool up this morning, Linda, and uh, Leeds is up a lot further. Let me show you where Leeds is. That was where the Thanksgiving service was that we went to uh, honour David Johnson. Edinburgh is further up in that waterway up there, so is Glasgow over there. Liverpool. I picked Liverpool up and I didn't notice the Weymouth is that um, little point there. Yeah, there. Gloucester. <laughs> Gloucester is nowhere near there. Yeah. Joan, you would know all this, wouldn't you? Yeah. Gloucester is way up here. London's on the coast. This was a... Uh, it was fine, uh, Kim, when I did this uh, uh, yesterday. I woke up this morning at 4 o'clock and had a look at it. Oh, look, that's not where... Uh, Gloss, that's one where Liverpool should be, and I missed, missed all the others. But this morning I want to focus on Cambridge, and I think that's it there. Derby, by the way, is up here. Cambridge is here. And that clock in the video that you saw is set up in a building that was built several hundred years ago. Uh, we wandered around the university campus of Cambridge for a whole day. And uh, most of the buildings were five or six hundred years old. One of them was even a thousand years old, built post-Crusade, or mm. well, built around the time of the Crusade. Uh, but wandering around all these buildings and getting a glimpse of the history of the place was fascinating. And then all of a sudden, uh, we ran into this window with this clock in the face of what looked like a clock, which didn't look like a clock really at all. Uh, but let's move on to the next slide, if I can. Yeah, David and Margaret Judson, David D. David J. Judson, 1940 to March the 6th, 2019. You see, he's done his dash. It's quite a, something that we often refer to at people's funerals, isn't it? He's done his dash now. You look back over his life. What did he achieve? What good was there in his life? Well, David Judson was a distant relative to Adoniram Judson of greater fame, who was a pioneer missionary to Burma many hundreds or many years ago. Well, and even, look at that, even Lebanon has got an N in the wrong place. Wow. Can we, can I preach this next Sunday? I'll get things all this up. <laughs> Michael, you're right for that? No, no, okay. Press on. Lebanon is where David Judson uh, spent most of his missionary life at the same time, or after a little bit of time, uh, in Lebanon, Joan and I went to Ajman in the United Arab Emirates. And there's a, a picture of another couple that we used to know a long time ago. Uh, so, uh, let's get right down to business. The clock. It's called that clock in that window. That's my picture that I took. Uh, a couple of three, week, three or four weeks ago up at Cambridge at the Corpus Christi College Library. By the way, the speaker that you saw on the video was John Taylor. He said that and he actually invented the cordless electric kettle and has done quite all right out of uh, electronics and his electrical business. He's a genius in his own right, a graduate of Corpus Christi College, by the way. And so he uh, had some money to spare. He wanted to renovate the uh, Corpus Christi Library. And part of the obligate, part of the contract was that he would uh, also install a clock. Well, there was no mean clock. That's a million pound, two million dollars worth, that clock. Just from getting engineers to uh, dream up the concept and so forth. Did you notice the eyelids of the grasshopper <laughs> open and close? Yeah. Randomly, by the way, and that's operated by a spring. It's all mechanical. He's got a spring-loaded eyelids in that grasshopper. 
and uh, it's just fascinating all the details that uh, he's put into it. And it was broad daylight, so you had to look very closely to see where the blue lights were telling you the time. I think it was about five past five when, uh, when I took that photo in the afternoon. I uh, put the next one in as well because I got that one off the web page. The picture that I took, the light was at the wrong angle and you can't quite see the grasshopper at the top, right? But uh, that grasshopper itself is quite a masterpiece of engineering. Uh, it's called a chronophage. He gave it that name deliberately because in fact that's what happens, as he said, to time in the hands of man. It gets eaten and so the clock is a time eater. Did you also notice that sometimes the second hand, the blue light on the outer rim, would go around quite quickly and other times it went fairly slowly? It catches up about every five minutes, so it does give accurate time. But uh, he also used that to make the point that uh, time is relative, depending on the circumstances in which we're in, our mood at the time, what we're involved in, and so forth, whether we're talking to a pretty girl or sitting on a hot stove, uh, etc. So uh, uh, I, I was fascinated by that clock, having walked around and been fascinated by all these great cathedrals on these college campuses and by the way saw the quadrangle where that Harold Abrahams used to run and try and beat, uh, beat the clock, uh, strike 12 times at midday. He didn't actually break that record, he didn't actually achieve that, that was achieved later on, a bit of, uh, a bit of uh, license in the film there, The Chariots of Fire, uh, but it has been done a couple of times since then. And cobblestone, uh, if not, not a smooth concrete track either. But anyway, that's enough. That's by the way. I'm wasting time now, aren't I? Uh, I've put that clock alongside that clock. This was my great-grandfather's clock, Jack Spratt. He built several grandfather clocks. He uh, was a watch <coughs> repairer and a watchmaker in the little town of Wooden Rivers where my dad grew up, or at least spent 16 of his years. Uh, Jack Spratt was a farm labourer, but uh, somebody gave him a watch to see if he could repair it, and he got it ticking nicely. He thought, oh, I can do this. So uh, he started repairing and, in fact, making clocks. And uh, this one he built for the Anglican Church, which was about 400 years old. It was restored in, in the uh, 19th century, it looked like that. And up in the uh, steeple there, he has put a clock, and uh, on the face of the clock is glory be to God. He uh, fashioned the letters out of bits of metal that he picked up around the village. He also made the mechanism for the clock from uh, scrap metal that he picked up around the village. He had his wife get uh, a coal fire going very hot and uh, melted metal and uh, shaped it and formed it into the shapes that you see there, <coughs> even with the gears on the wheels. And that clock has kept good time. Well, it was still working uh, when we were there in 1981. And the uh, hours chime hymn tunes uh, on the hour, and, but that, that, that part of it's not working now. It needs some maintenance work done on it. But the, uh, ward, the warder, the warden, was there when we visited the clock a few weeks ago and he actually started the clock and you can hear it ticking over, just working like as if it was brand new. Uh, uh, so he did that for the coronation of, of King George V. All right, I'll leave that there as a little bit of a, uh, a side issue. I've got no more slides for you, but I've just got some text here. I want to share with you just two texts to uh, stress the importance of time and why it is there. Now, wait on. I do have something there which also has messed up in the translation. What happened? Linda, I'm going back to work on that. That should be where you see the M-L-O-U. That should be the Hebrew text and it didn't translate. But uh, the Hebrew word in the Old Testament was two he main Hebrew words in the Old Testament for time. 
and Joan read one of them this morning. There is time for everything. The word is I. Now that little comma upside down means that you've got to choke yourself when you say that first letter. I. And the top one, Alam. And it's interesting, I thought, that in Arabic, the word for world, the world in which we live is Alam. It's from the same Semitic root. In other words, we're locked in a world of time. Time, that word alam or alam is from a, a, a root that means to conceal or be concealed. In other words, we don't know when time is going to end. We don't know the limitation of time. And that word alam is the word that is translated time and time again in scripture as eternity. So we think of eternity as not having an end at all, but the strict translation of the words we use simply means that we don't know how long we have, what uh, length of time. Perpetuity, I suppose, would be a, a fancy word to, to use in describing the uh, measurement of time. It's never ending, all right, we understand that too. Is it never ending? Well, I think of life on earth as being, well, as an illustration about when you were in your mother's womb. And then the, well, you weren't even you then, you were just an egg. And then that egg was fertilized and ultimately you were born. I suppose it's a little bit like that, uh, living here on planet Earth, on this orb. We have this, this oh, intrinsic existence. We are just an egg, just a part human being. But then we are born again. And there is a chance then that we will be born into a whole realm of eternity beyond the... Uh, uh, entrapment of time, if you like. So eternity is really defined as existence outside this world. And it's something to look forward to because this world has got its bumps, hasn't it? It's satisfactory, but at times it can be quite unsatisfactory. And in fact, even unsatisfactoriness is a tool that God uses in time to change us, to make us mature in Christ. Uh, we count it all joy we, when we encounter various trials, knowing that testing of our faith produces endurance. So don't be too hard on God if now or if in the future you are experiencing hard times of one kind or another. In this time capsule called Earth, we are experiencing hard times in order to harden us up and to make us creatures fit for eternity. So these scriptures are from Romans chapter 5, and I've just quoted from Romans 5 anyway, but further down in the chapter, verse 6 says this, for while we were still helpless, at the right time, there's that word again, time, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. You see, even God uh, limits himself to the realm of time when it comes to dealing with us earthlings. At the right time, Christ did what we needed him to do. We need to be very thankful for that. We need to be people who praise the Lord and say amen often. Otherwise, we might end up going over the cliff into oblivion. Praise the Lord anyway. And uh, God, leave our lives in God's hand. Because at the right time, God does just what he has to do. Experiencing suffering at the moment? At the right time, God will lift that from your shoulders. Well, a, the corollary, or sorry, the uh, response to that ought to be what we find in Ephesians 5, for instance. I've got my book.
bookmark here, so I'll read it. I've got part of the text in my notes. But I'll read from verse 15 of chapter 5, and this will be my penultimate thought for this morning. Therefore, be careful how you walk, or how you live. Not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. By the way, that word, making the most of your time, comes from the Greek language uh, in the marketplace, buying up the time. In other words, time slips away. You've got to go to the marketplace and you've got to buy time. Buy up time. Make sure that you are spending your time in uh, wise pursuits because you have a job of countering the evil that is in the world. So let me read that again from verse 15. Be careful how you live, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days of evil. Or I could even add, because Christ has died for you. You have a debt to pay. Anyway, we won't go down that line of theology. That's a whole sermon in itself. But verse 17, so then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't get drunk with wine, for that's dissipation. There's a word to look up in your dictionary. But be filled with the Spirit. Yes, be uh, consumed with profitable enterprise. When you are sick and in hospital and I visit you, I would like to find that you've got a Bible or a Bible commentary by your bedside and not the latest magazine. Make the most of your time because Christ has died for you. Well, I've got in my notes here the Jews are still looking forward, aren't they, to their Messiah, to the time when that Messiah will come and will restore their earthly kingdom. And I think we Christians have too much of an earthly perspective on existence. Our prayer points are usually to do with people's well-being, and that's fair enough too, but I like Severine's prayer this morning about praying for our lost loved ones, people who need yet to know the value of... Uh, of the Christian faith. Well, the Jews are still looking for it, but they're looking for an earthly kingdom. Christians can look back to the Messiah's coming. He's already been. And uh, at that time, he brought a heavenly kingdom to earth. And we're experiencing it in small part. We've got a down payment now, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1. We've got a, a, a little glimpse of that heavenly life, that kingdom life. So that we can now look forward, and we should be looking forward to his coming. We can't emphasize that enough, can we? Let's not get caught up in the humdrum, the mundane of existence here, even if it is Christian existence, even if it is uh, godly spiritual existence. Let's not get caught up. Let's not see that as the end in itself. We are looking forward, brothers and sisters, to the conclusion of earthly time and the joy of true heavenly life. Isn't that something to look forward to? The Bible can't, des can't describe what is indescribable, so it doesn't describe eternity for us, no more than it describes heaven. You look through the pages of Scripture, we don't really know what we're in for, just that it's heaven. But what's heaven like? By the human words, locked in the time of this earthly capsule, have no words to describe what heaven is going to be like. And we can't understand how life can be without a clock, without time to constrain us or restrain us. Yes, we look forward to the conclusion of earthly time. The Bible is revelation for earth's inhabitants who are governed by time. Yes, that's where we are. But the Hebrew Bible's key words on time can refer to a point in time uh, a period of event, or the same words can refer to an inconceivably long duration, and we use the word eternity to, con to describe that. At our consummation, we will be transported into the realm of existence that is timeless. In this way, our eternal life will be immortal. There's those two words brought together. Immortal life, 1 Corinthians 15 describes that beautifully, I think. And it's immortal, it can't die, and it's got all eternity to try to kill us. 
it's not going to succeed because now we're in Christ and uh, he is immutable, he is immutable.